certificates. At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Jim Kapros is Director of HVA Sales for System Sensor. Jim, take it away. All right, thank you, David, and welcome everyone to this presentation. We are going to throw quite a bit of information at you in a pretty short amount of time, so, uh, but please do, as David said, uh, participate, ask questions as you have them. We will try and get to everyone when we can, real time, and if not, we will make sure that we circle back with you with an answer. The agenda for today's presentation on duct smoke detectors, we're going to talk about the anatomy and operation of a duct smoke detector. We're going to cover an installation overview, talk about some important features of the product. We'll talk about codes and standards, as well as testing. The anatomy and operation of a duct smoke detector. There are two basic types of technology used in duct smoke detectors, photoelectric and ionization. The big question is, which technology is best for duct smoke detectors? Uh, what types of fires do they detect? And what's best suited for HVAC applications? The first technology we're going to talk about is the photoelectric detector. Now, the photoelectric detector has really become the industry standard. And the way it works, it uses a light-emitting diode and a photodiode, basically a transmitter and receiver. It sends a pulse of light into the smoke sensing chamber that's dark in color, and then as the smoke particles enter that chamber, that pulse light reflects off of the smoke particles from the transmitter into the receiver, which causes your alarm. The second type of detector that's available is an ionization detector. Ionization detector actually uses a radioactive material, the americium-241, as a source, and it's looking for smoke particles to enter into its sensing chamber. They bond and change the charge of the ions, which changes your, your current draw, your current consumption, which gives you your alarm. Ionization detectors do have a place, and they are a valuable product. Unfortunately, a lot of times they are misapplied and misused. They're really designed for locations that are going to have hot flash fires versus a standard commercial application where you're going to have a cold or smoldering fire. NFPA 72 recommends the use of photoelectric detectors for HVAC applications. Um, photoelectric detection technology has advantages over an ionization detection technology in air duct system applications. So what are those differences and why is it appropriate to use photoelectric versus an ionization detector. Why it's more appropriate is photoelectric technology responds better to the larger smoke particles found in ductwork during a fire. Another advantage is only a photoelectric duct smoke detector offers low flow performance capable of operating in air speeds as low as 100 feet per minute. With me which meets the current HVAC applications and codes. The anatomy of a duct smoke detector, what you see here is basically just a, a, a blown up diagram of all the parts and components of a duct smoke detector. The sensor utilizes a sampling tube that's located into the airstream. Um, then it has a smoke detector head, a photoelectric sensing technology head that's inside the housing. The available operating voltages are 24 volts DC and AC, 120 volts AC, and then 240 volts AT is also available in a different version. We don't see very much 240 used domestically in the U.S. Uh, but there are some applications and some requirements internationally for 240 volts. That model is available if you do have that requirement. So how do they actually work? What is the principle of operation? Basically, a duct smoke detector is a smoke detector in a housing that uses pressure differential between the sampling tube and the exhaust tube to draw an air sample out of the duct work route it through the chamber of the smoke detector to check for smoke. 
when the detector senses smoke, it'll go into alarm. The relays will change state on the control board side, and that will in turn shut down the fan of the air handler or cause an alarm at a fire panel, activate a trouble alarm, uh, or remote test accessory. The sampling tube installation. Sampling tube, our model is DST, followed by a number for the length of the sampling tube. They are recommended for specific outside duct widths for the ODW. Up to one foot, we recommend a DST-1. One. one to two feet is a DST-1.5. Two to four feet is a DST-3. Four to eight feet is a DST-5. And eight to 12 feet is a DST-10. One thing to make sure of is that the arrow basically will indicate that the holes are oriented into the airflow, which is very important. And the second thing that's required is that end cap on the sampling tube must be in place for it to function. How do we install the sampling tube? First of all, we have to select the proper sampling tube length for the duct enclosure. If the duct is more than three feet wide, you may have to drill an appropriate diameter hole directly opposite, but two to three inches lower to support the sampling tube length longer than three feet. The standard says that if a sampling tube is greater than three feet, it has to be supported. Now, it can be supported one of two ways. It can be supported either by drilling the hole on the far side of the ductwork and using that. You may run into instances, though, where you can't make that penetration on the far side of the ductwork due to lack of space uh, or the, the length of the sampling tube that you're using. It's also permissible to put a wire hanger in the middle of the ductwork to support that sampling tube. The thing to remember is that sampling tubes greater than three feet have to be supported one of those two ways. Next step is to position the holes or openings located along the length of the sampling tube into the airflow. We need to make sure it's facing into the airflow so it will draw that appropriate amount of air across the duct detector head. If the duct sampling tube does make a penetration through the far side, it's very important that you make sure that the red cap is in place and that any openings are properly sealed. It has to be sealed completely so you don't allow air to escape out of the penetration. Now, the types of duct detectors that are available in the market, um, Conventional duct detectors, both two-wire and four-wire. Intelligent addressable duct detectors are also available through uh, fire panel manufacturers and OEM partners. And then we also have a watertight housing, which is a NEMA 4 rated. The advantage, obviously, of the watertight housing is that it eliminates the cost of a third-party enclosure when you're trying to maintain a watertight NEMA 4 listing. Dave, it looks like it's time for a poll question. I'll turn it over to you. Very good, Jim. Thank you very much, and thank you. Uh, good start to the presentation. So we do have a break here for a poll question, so we'd like you to get, get an answer from you on the following question. Uh, do you include duct smoke detectors on all applicable commercial quotes or specifications? So is it yes or a no? Maybe it doesn't apply to you for whatever reason. But can you uh, go ahead and answer that? So do you include duct detectors on all applicable commercial quotes and specifications? Uh, Jim, we have had a couple people post questions. And uh, I guess the first one is, um, it's a curious one, what altitude are the ionization detectors rated to? Is that something we've come across before? Uh, it is. Ionization detectors um, do suffer consequences at high altitude. I don't have the exact altitude above sea level where it starts to degrade. Uh, we do have that information and I can get that for you and provide it to you. Very good. And uh, they're asking a question about addressable uh, duct detectors. Do we offer addressable duct detectors or how can they get a duct detector to be addressable? System Sensor still manufactures addressable duct detectors for our fire alarm uh, panel partners. 
those addressable intelligence duct detectors need to be purchased through the fire alarm panel manufacturer. An additional way to do that is if you're in an application where you need an addressable duct detector, you can always add a monitor module to a conventional duct detector, allowing it to interface with an addressable fire system. Okay, very good. So just looking at the poll results here, I'm going to go ahead and close them. So thank you for voting. We had over 646 people participate in that, and we've got over 760 people online with us for this webinar. So thank you for joining us too, and thank you for voting. So Jim, looks like overwhelmingly 72% of our uh, population, at least attending this webinar, do include duct detectors on applicable commercial quotes or specs. So let's go to the next slide, and back to you, Jim. Okay, thanks, Deb. All right, now we're going to run into or begin the installation overview. And again, this is going to be high-level information, so if we need more detail, please feel free to ask questions or we'll cover follow-up. Um, where can we see installations of duct smoke detectors? Where are they installed? They can be mounted on uh, HVAC, HVAC ductwork inside the space. They are also available as an option in commercial uh, AC packaged units. So your rooftop manufacturers, most rooftop manufacturers offer duct detectors factory installed as an option, the rooftop installation. And then you'll also see them on dampers. For installations on the HVAC ductwork, and again, these are our generalities. It's not always the case with every single job. Most installations we find, um, duct detectors are installed by the mechanical contractor. Um, alarm indication devices, as required by local code, uh, will be installed usually by the mechanical contractor, or it could be a fire alarm contractor. And then the fire alarm contractor will connect the fire alarm system when it's required. This diagram just shows an installation of a typical duct detector in standard duct work. Uh, it just for illustration purposes shows you, you the duct width, the direction of the airflow, where the sampling tube is mounted, the way that the um, sampling holes are faced into the airstream exhaust tube. And again, another typical installation in the air handling system on the supply side, you see the main air supply duct uh, downstream of filters. And then if it's on the return side, you'll see it's before the return air fan. A lot of people will ask, well, why would you put it in the supply? Why would you put it in the return? We put this out here so that you can see it because depending on what standard you're designing to, one says that you have to put the duct detector in the supply side. The other says you put it in the return side. And there are some applications where you require in both supply and return, depending on the size of the unit. Now this slide basically is going to cover some rules of thumb and some recommendations. Um, and it's important that we understand that these are recommendations that we have for location and mounting of the duct detectors. One thing that we do have to do is be sure that we get an adequate air sample. So wherever the duct detector is mounted, we have to make sure that we're going to have a proper air sample because without proper airflow, the duct detector won't function correctly. The industry standard recommended is a six duct width rule. Now that is recommended by NFPA. That's not a required standard. It is a recommended best practice. The reason that it's not a true requirement is there are going to be some applications where you just physically cannot go that six duct width away. So if you're in that type of application where you can't get that specific spacing, then you basically have to do the best you can to try and avoid stratified air and make sure that you still have a proper air sample flowing across the head. Duct smoke detectors should be located a minimum of 10 feet downstream from a humidifier. Um, further is better because anytime you're introducing humidity into the duct work in most commercial spaces now and residential spaces, they have system humidifiers, water and electronics don't 
mix very well. So the further away you can get it from the humidifier, the better off you'll be. Again, the six duct width from a bend or a change in airflow direction. And what we're really trying to do and why you see, you're seeing a common theme is we're really trying to avoid turbulent air or stratified air. We want the smoothest, most consistent airflow that we can get out of the ductwork. It's also very important to make sure that you eliminate the air leaks in and out of the ductwork. Um, we want to make sure that we have a good seal in the ductwork and around the duct detector so that we ensure we maintain that proper pressure differential so that the detector functions correctly. One of the most important things and, the, uh, and one of the first steps that we do in installing a duct smoke detector is we need to verify the duct airspeed, temperature, and humidity. And all of those must be within the manufacturer's operating range. Typically for temperature negative 4 to 158 and humidity at 0 to 95 percent um, for your humidity. We have to make sure that we have the proper airspeed, temperature, and humidity for that detector to function correctly. Again, we have to verify airflow and direction so that we know which way to orientate the sampling to to ensure we have proper function. This next slide basically just shows you the contact. It's a it's a exploded view of terminal designations on the control board side. Four wire duct detector contacts. We have auxiliary contacts. Um, those are normally closed. That's normally closed. That's used to shut off a blower motor or a fan, or depending on how you're shutting down the system, line voltage, however you're, you're doing your shutdown. Supervisory contacts, those are used to initiate a trouble signal to your remote test accessory or to a fire panel. And then alarm contacts are used to initiate an alarm signal to the fire panel. And we also see the factory OEM installation, and we touched on that briefly, that most commercial rooftop manufacturers offer duct smoke detectors as a factory installed option. Um, it's an accessory option for them. The product that is installed in those rooftop units a lot of times uh, will require some customization to fit inside of their uh, rooftop unit. They're factory installed. And it's usually uh, optional where you have it installed. It can be in the return or the supply or in both, depending on the local municipality and the size of the air handler unit. Now, the air conditioning units may replicate the wiring terminals of the detector in the control section of their box. Some rooftop manufacturers do this just for ease uh, of installation that off the production line, they will run with the wiring and the wiring harnesses back into the control cabinet that basically reduces the need of the contractor, the installer, the service technician to get into the guts of the unit. They can go to the control cabinet and do their wiring there. It's really more for ease of use and installation. You may also see remote mounted sampling tubes utilized in the return section or the economizer, which is an outside air damper of the commercial units. That's perfectly acceptable. Um, what is required is not necessarily that the duct detector be located in a specific place, but that the air sample is drawn from a specific area. So remote sampling is acceptable and allowed. Another thing that we'll see in rooftop installations, if it's not a factory installed and we're going back and doing a field installed application or service replacement work, that type of thing, we can also use our watertight UV resistant housing, our NEMA 4 rated product. Um, it's great for rooftop installation. It eliminates the bulky and costly NEMA 4 third party enclosure. Um, it's UL listed. Temperature range is negative 4 to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. It's listed down to negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit in standby mode. One thing to remember about the 
NEMA 4 watertight version is you have to use liquid tight conduit and connectors for that installation. Using a non watertight or liquid tight connector basically on a watertight housing is going to allow water to penetrate. So we have to use watertight connectors as well as the housing. There are some also some special applications that we run into. Um, these detectors, while not a true duct detector, is still a smoke detector that's mounted in duct work. Uh, they're specially listed for pendant mount applications. It's a spot type duct smoke detector or pendant mount in duct work. And these are applied in spaces where there's either um, space constraints or we have to meet a no flow or low flow airspeed application. If you're less than 100 feet per minute of airflow, that's considered no flow. And then we would have to use a spot type detector versus a duct detector. Because if you remember, Earlier, we talked about duct detectors work off the pressure differential of the air of the airspeed. If there's not a minimum of at least 100 feet per minute, then we can't get appropriate pressure differential between the sampling tube and the exhaust tube. So a standard duct detector would not work in that application because it requires airflow to draw the sample in. Some important features about the product. The enhanced operation features it has an enhanced operating range of negative 4 to 158. It has built-in low flow circuit enhancement. Our duct detectors will operate from 100 to 4,000 feet per minute for airspeed uh, out of the box. And the duct detectors that we provide and offer have an adjustable mounting footprint. We do something that's unique to the market as well in offering uh, installation flexibility by allowing for a two to one configuration. And what that two to one configuration actually means is we will allow you to control, monitor, and test and reset two smoke detector heads with one control board and one remote test accessory. Why is that important? It can be a substantial cost savings if you're in a bid situation or in you're in an application where you have to cover both supply and return because of the size of the unit or the local code requirements. This will allow you to do that. One way to do it is to connect the sensor only D4S to a standard 4120 on the power board. So you would have one standard duct detector and then one detector only D4S connect them together to cover the supply and return. The second way that you can meet this requirement is by connecting two sensor only D4Ss to a power board only, which is a D4P120. Now, a lot of people ask, well, when would we ever do this? When would we ever see this kind of configuration? We see this configuration in some of the rooftop manufacturers because space is at a premium in their cabinetry. So this allows them to put the small heads out in the airstream and to remote them back to the power board. We've also seen it on um, field installed applications where there's just not enough room for a full size duct detector due to the size of the duct or the ability to get in it <clears throat> for work reasons. So this can allow you to, to put your duct detector heads out in the ductwork and remote them back to a power board where you could actually mount that power board in a mechanical room or someplace else, which would allow you ease of wiring and maintenance and testing for the power board when you have space constraints out in the field on the ductwork. Additional installation costs, uh, savings. It's a simple sampling tube attachment. Our sampling tube is just a snap and click, and it can be mounted from either the front or the rear of the housing. There are no tools required. Um, as well as on the sampling tube, it is teed so that you have an arrow that shows you which way the hole space, so you can make sure that's put into the airstream. 
our products are compatible with previous designs and the competitive products. Having a changeable footprint which allows one SKU to be either a square or rectangular footprint allows us great flexibility in the field. Um, it has an identical footprint to our legacy products. We maintained a consistent wiring number, numbers and terminal designations from our legacy products. And it's also compatible with all of our old legacy remote test accessories. This product also has greater wiring space. There's more space in the power board side, so it's much easier to wire. Um, we have a high contrast terminal designation. It's a bright neon yellow with black layering, so it's a little easier to see and read. And we have multiple conduit entries that include two half inch and one three quarter inch conduit knockout. All right, it looks like it's time for our next poll question. All right, very good, Jim. Thank you. So the next poll question is about testing and maintenance. So do you include testing and maintenance of a duct detector in your service contract? So for those of you that run a business around fire detection or HVAC or maybe you're an electrician dialing in, uh, do you include duct detectors in your testing and maintenance? Of course, if you're, a, if you're an HJ or an engineer, service contracts may not apply to you. Go ahead and click that. Uh, icon there or the button there. Jim, we have a ton of questions posted. In fact, so many that we will not get to all of the online questions. I will, I'll guarantee you that. We've got over 40 questions posted right now. So let's go through a couple of them while people are voting here. Um, okay. Are there any special application duct detectors for clean rooms or places that have high velocity airflow? Uh, th there's not a, a special application duct detector for clean rooms or high velocity airflow. Really what we're getting in then is you're looking at an aspiration system. Uh, system sensor, we do offer a fast aspiration product. Uh, that's really for clean rooms, uh, but there's not a specific clean room duct detector. Okay, all right. We had a number of people ask the question about the length of wire uh, or the maximum length between a sensor and the power board. Uh, why don't we go ahead and answer that question. Is there, is there a maximum length between those two? Uh, there is, but it, it, in, in reality, in practical terms, you're not going to reach it. I would have to get with engineering and get the exact wire run length because it's going to be determined about what so by what size of wire you're using, what gauge of wire. Um, hmm. But in all practical reality, you'd never exceed that wiring limit. There's just not enough. I mean, you would have to run it from building to building almost to do that. But I can get the exact number from engineering. Okay. All right. Very good. So let's look at the poll results. Looks like uh, about 62% are indicating yes, that they are including testing and maintenance in their service contracts, 9% no, and then 28 uh, or almost 29 does not apply. So. You know, looking at the time, let's go ahead and uh, continue with your presentations. And, and folks, we will get to many of your questions at the end, time permitting. Uh, and if not, uh, we'll try to follow up with you afterwards. Uh, the next section we're going to jump into is codes and standards. Um, now again, these codes and standards, these are based on national standards and industry standards. I know that each municipality is going to be different. Um, so again, what we are going to give you is um, what the national standards say. If you have a different requirement locally, or if you're not sure what's being used locally for design and testing and maintenance purposes, you'll need to check with the local AHJ or the authority having jurisdiction to determine exactly what's being enforced in your municipality. So what is the purpose of a duct smoke, of duct smoke detection? Why should building codes include smoke detection in the HVAC systems. The reason we do is the codes recognize, both codes, the Na uh, International Mechanical and NFPA, recognize the ability of air duct systems to transfer smoke, toxic gases, and flame from one area to another. Smoke can be a, a serious hazard to life safety unless blowers are shut down and appropriate dampers are actuated. What we really want to do is make sure that if there is an incident in a building that we are not transferring smoke from the affected area to a non-affected area causing widespread damage 
risk to life and, and panic is really what it boils down to. So the International Mechanical Code. What the International Mechanical Code states is in the return air system, smoke detectors shall be installed in return air systems with a capacity greater than 2,000 CFM in the return air duct or plenum upstream of any filters, exhaust air connection, or outdoor air connections. There is an exception. The exception is smoke detectors are not required in a return air system where all portions of the building served by the air distribution system are protected by area smoke detectors connected to a fire alarm system in accordance with the International Fire Code. Some people read that, and again, this is interpretation, but what the code is actually stating is that if you have a total coverage system, then you're not required to have duct detectors. But anything short of a total coverage system, which would be a partial coverage system, does require duct smoke detectors. Now, the International Mechanical Code says that if it's greater than 2,000 CFM or 5 ton or larger, it has to have a duct smoke detector in the return side. Common supply and return system for, in, for the IMC, when multiple air handling systems share common supply or return air ducts or plenums with a combined capacity over 2,000 CFM, the return air system shall be provided with duct smoke detectors. Some of you may be asking, well, why is that important? You know, that's basically what we said in the previous slide. The difference here is, is when it's a common supplier return, a lot of buildings now are going to smaller units. So the individual unit may not be five ton or larger. It may be smaller than 2,000 CFM. But if that combined space, if you have four units and the combined capacity is greater than 2,000 CFM, then you still have to include duct smoke detectors. You can't substitute multiple small units in place of one large unit and get away with not putting in the duct detectors. They're looking at the combined capacity of the space. When return air risers serve two or more stories and serve any portion of a return air system having a design capacity of greater than 15,000 CFM, smoke detectors shall be installed at each story. Also, if the adopted building code does require a fire alarm system, the duct smoke detectors must be connected to a fire alarm system so that the activation of any duct smoke detector will cause a visible and audible supervisory signal to be indicated at a constantly attended location or cause an alarm signal. Basically, what it's saying is if you're in a building and it has duct detectors and it has a fire alarm system, they have to be connected together. So that's what this, the International Mechanical Code states. That's their standard. Now, the NFPA 90A, it's a standard for installation of air conditioning and ventilating systems, is very similar in scope and requirement as the International Mechanical Code. The main difference is NFPA 90A states that placement of the duct detectors will be on the supply side versus the return side. And again, smoke detector listed for use in air distribution shall be located as follows. Uh, downstream of the air filters and ahead of any branch connection in the air supply system having the capacity of greater than 2,000 feet per minute or 2,000 PSM at each story prior to the connection to a common return and prior to any recirculation or fresh air inlet connection in air return systems having a capacity greater than 15,000 PFM and serving more than one story. So you can see here per NFPA, this is where you can get into depending on the size of the unit. If it's greater than 15,000 CFM, the standard for NFPA says that it's going to be supply and return. If it's less than 15,000 CFM but greater than 2,000 CFM, then it's on the supply side. The industry in general, the rule of thumb is if that unit is 2,000 CFM, is larger than 2,000 CFM, you're going to be required to install at least one duct smoke detector, whether it's International Mechanical or NFPA, 
the true difference is where you locate it. NFPA goes on and talks about the function of the duct detector, what it's supposed to do. Duct smoke detectors shall automatically stop their respective fan or fans on detecting the presence of smoke. Again, we want to stop the transference of, of harmful materials from one section of a building to another. Where the return air fan is functioning as part of an engineered smoke control system and a different mode is required, the duct smoke detectors are not required to automatically stop their respective fans. That's important to know for your knowledge. If you are in a building that they are doing a smoke control system, even if it, there is a duct detector, that duct detector, while it activates, may not be required to shut off an air handler or shut off a fan. It may be designed in that, in that engineered system to actually turn on an exhaust fan to draw smoke out of the building. So just be aware of that. Now, on NFPA 90A, we talk about their installation requirements. It states that smoke detectors shall be installed, tested, and maintained in accordance with NFPA 72, which is the National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code. That's important to know because that's what's going to determine where it gets installed, how frequently, and how it gets tested, and how it gets maintained. This is for NFPA 90A. Now, if we go back to the International Mechanical Code that we talked about, they reference duct smoke detectors being used in accordance with the fire alarm system for the International Fire Code. Well, the International Fire Code also references NFPA 72 for testing, maintenance, and installation. I know it's kind of convoluted and kind of confusing. At the end of the day, both of the standards whether it's a direct route or kind of a roundabout way, are saying that installation, testing, and maintenance need to comply with the NFPA 72 standards. Continuing with 90A, where smoke detectors required by Section 6 are installed in a building not equipped with an approved fire alarm system as specified by 6442, the following shall occur. Smoke detector activation shall cause a visual signal in an audible signal in a normally occupied area, and smoke detector trouble conditions shall be indicated visually or audibly in a normally occupied area and shall be identified as air duct detector trouble. A lot of people believe that if there's not a fire alarm system uh, required in the building, they, they don't have to put duct detectors in. That's not the case. You still have to put the duct detector in, and you still have to re put the remote enunciation or remote indicator in. That is required, whether there's a fire alarm system or not. And this is an important one that gets missed a lot. Um, it, it's really important, and we are trying to get this message out to everyone. Where smoke detectors are installed in concealed locations more than 3 meters or 10 feet above the finished floor, or in arrangements where the detector's alarm or supervisory indicator is not visible to responding personnel, the detector shall be provided with remote alarm or supervisory indication in a location acceptable to the AHJ. So most duct detectors by default, by their nature, they're going to be greater than 10 feet above the finished floor. Duct detectors installed in a rooftop, obviously, responding personnel can't see those indicators. So we know per the standard, you have to have some type of remote indication. Also, if you're in a commercial building that has a drop tile ceiling, you're not going to be able to see those indicators on the duct detector itself. So again, a, a remote alarm or supervisor indication is required anytime the duct detector is not readily visible and it's greater than 10 feet above the finished floor. What that really tells you is that you should be designing, selling, installing duct detectors and remote indication devices, whatever version you sell, or on a, almost a one-to-one -one basis. The next section we'll talk about is testing. 
recall that in the previous slides we talked about how both International Mechanical and NFPA 90 reference NFPA, uh, NFPA 72 for installation testing and maintenance. That's why this is important. The following that we're going to talk about are recommended tests that should be performed on any installed duct smoke detectors, um, regardless of the make and manufacturer. There are certain required tests. Those are NFPA and UL functional tests. We also recommend that every duct detector that's installed or services that you do an airflow verification test to make sure that it's installed properly. And then there's also a direct application of smoke to a sensor head test. NFPA 72, what their test requirements are laid out here for you. The requirements from 72 in Table 14.3.1, Section 17b, requires that we perform a visual inspection semi-annually. So every six months, per the standard to be code compliant, we're required to do a visual inspection of the duct detector. That visual inspection basically includes making sure it's mounted correctly, making sure it, it, you know, there's no leaks, that it's sealed, that the LEDs are flashing, that it's in a normal state. The second test that's required is a functional test. Duct detectors are required by code to be functionally tested once a year. And the third test that's required is the sensitivity test. Sensitivity test is required within one year of commissioning or after installation, and then every alternate year after that up to five years. Now there are multiple testing capabilities built into the product, and these are performed by either an installer or an AHJ. There is the remote test station. Um, there's a magnet test. There's a push button test. Obviously a pressure differential test needs to be completed, um, a smoke test, and a sensitivity test. Remote testing, the RTS2 and RTS2 AOS remote test station connects to the detector and use, utilizes a test circuit, test and reset by, by key switch. Um, it's multifunction. It tells you the status, remote test, audible visible notification, and sensitivity measurement. This is the Cadillac of remote alarm indication and test products. This meets all the code requirements for remote annunciation, indication, testing, reset, as well as allowing the field personnel ease of testing because they don't have to get to the actual unit. They can do everything from the floor. This product can support two separate sensors. When you do the two to one configuration that we talked about earlier, you can maintain and test both of those heads separately using one remote test accessory. That saves you the cost of an additional remote test and indication accessory. The RTS2 AOS model, it ships with a built-in strobe. Uh, the AOS is also sold separately if you need to field install with an RTS2. If you need to upgrade a standard uh, RTS2 to an AOS, you can do that. It's just a plug-and-play um, board. We also have an alarm test with a magnet. To test the detector with a magnet, replace the magnet on the test locator. It's molded into the housing so you can see that the LED is going to latch on. Um, once that LED latches on, that's basically indicating it's an alarm. The relays are going to change state. We need to verify that the fan shut down. And then you can reset the detector by pressing the reset button on the front cover of the detector. The push button test, that push button test is designed to meet NFPA and UL functional test requirements. And what they state is we have to electronically or mechanically simulate gray smoke, not to exceed 6% obscuration. Uh, it assures the detector is operable and responds to minimum smoke requirements. This is different from the other products offered in the field because other products when you do the push the test button, what they're actually simulating and testing is the circuitry, that it's 
wired correctly, ours actually goes that next step and electronically simulates smoke in the chamber. Now we've talked about uh, pressure differential and the principle of operation of a duct detector. This is something that should be done on every duct detector that's installed or in the field. Um, airflow verification and duct smoke response. Pressure differential should be measured across the sampling tubes using a manometer. This is a manufacturer's acceptable test as pressure difference is the principle of operation for duct smoke detectors. If we don't have that pressure differential, that means we don't have airflow, and if we don't have airflow, the duct detector is not going to function correctly. The way you perform that pressure differential test is remove the cover. Uh, you'll see the, the plugs on the end of the tubes. Those mount into or plug into the sampling tube and the exhaust tube. Um, insert the manometer tubes. You'll get the reading. And what you're looking for is a differential pressure. It has to be between 0 0.01 and 1.10 in water weight. That's going to, as long as you're between those two limit that ensures that you're getting a proper airflow, that you're drawing a proper air sample across the smoke detector head. Smoke testing, uh, smoke testing at the sensor head, uh, applied canned smoke directly to the detector head to an initiate alarm. Sampling and exhaust tubes may need to be blocked off for this test and then reopened afterwards, depending on where it's at. That's one way to do it. There is also another way to do it where you uh, basically make a penetration in the ductwork upstream, spray the smoke into the, the sampling, into the ductwork, let it be drawn through the sampling tube. That's the second way to do it. The next slide um, that I want to talk about is pretty important. I run into a lot in the field um, when we talk about testing, uh, the use of smoke bombs. If you look at UL and what UL and NFPA both state as far as recommended testing, they both reference the manufacturer's recommended testing, acceptable testing. Smoke bombs are not a recommended test method. And the reason that they're not, and I know they're still widely used in the field, smoke bomb generates a particular amount of chemical smoke, which represents a staged fire. The duct detector is monitoring a sample of the sample of smoke. In addition, the density of the smoke tends to diminish the farther it travels from the source. The smoke generated is a chemical reaction and does not truly represent smoke. Smoke bombs produce cold smoke particles, which are larger and are not easily detected. These particles are also dependent on relative humidity, distance traveled from the source, and time of activation. This phenomenon is caused by the smoke being a mist rather than being true smoke, which are suspended solids and warm gases. Another problem with smoke bombs, there is no industry standard pertaining to the smoke bombs and how they're manufactured. They may be made of different chemical substances and may not allow the detectors to respond properly within the specified time limit or provide the required obscuration. It may also be possible to pass a smoke bomb test and be out of the required manometer range for sampling, uh, giving the installer a false sense of proper operation. The manometer test must be performed. We have to perform that test. But we absolutely do not recommend smoke bombs for testing. If, if it's required to have smoke introduced to the head, then we suggest that you introduce canned smoke to the smoke detector head and do not use smoke bombs. Now, our product also has internal sensitivity tests detector, um, and you can read it through the LED, because you remember we talked about NFPA standards requiring that sensitivity test one year after acceptance and then every other year. Um, our detector has it built in um, for self-monitoring. The, the blinking green LED indicates that our detector is operating within the um, required sensitivity threshold. 
but if you are in a situation where you need an actual reading, we offer our Sense Reader, our SENS RDR. It utilizes, utilizes infrared technology to read the sensitivity. Um, you can take this to the remote test accessory, that RTS2 or RTS2 AOS, point it at the you'll see a spot on there molded into the housing where you place the sensitivity reader, you push the button, then it will actually give you a true obscuration per foot sensitivity reading, as well as a textual message that says good, service, or replace. Dave, looks like we're ready for our final poll question. Yep, we sure are, and we've got seven or eight minutes left in the presentation here. So we'll leave this poll question up for um, probably the remainder of the time. Uh, we do have one final slide for you, but this was really how, how can we help you? So is there, is there more detail you'd like, uh, let's say from our application guide. This is a, uh, a multi-page, uh, highly technical guide that answers a lot of questions about duct smoke detection. Duct smoke detection tends to be one of our highest technical service calls because quite frankly, um, it's, the people are dealing with duct smoke detectors may not be dealing with them every day. So they, they deal with them once in a while and, and have questions. Maybe you want the product guide. So there's a product brochure. That's the second one. And we've created a commonly asked questions. That's an FAQ, frequently asked questions sheet or you'd like to be contacted. Maybe Jim or one of our salespeople can reach out to you and uh, answer a question or help with an order or a sale. So uh, please go ahead and, and fill this out. And uh, in the meantime, Jim, we have over 50 questions posted. So folks, we are not going to get to every one of your questions. I apologize in advance, but we will follow up with you where we can. Uh, so we'll get to a couple of these now. Uh, a lot of questions about the manometer. Uh, and they're recommend what, who's, do we recommend a brand? Do we sell them? Where do they find them? How, well, how can you address that question, Jim? We personally at System Sensor, we don't recommend a specific manometer manufacturer. Um, we don't build one. We don't sell one. You can get them at any HVAC distributor, any, uh, any place uh, that's doing wholesale distribution, um, it's any place that sells testing meters. Uh, it's, it's very similar to any kind of airflow meter or multimeter, anything like that. Uh, those are found at wholesale distribution. We personally do not sell one or manufacture one. All right, very good. Um, number of questions about smoke testing. So here's one that's kind of symbolic of that. When smoke testing duct detectors, does the smoke need to be introduced into the duct through the sampling tube or directly on the smoke detector? It's either or. Um, it can be um, introduced into the ductwork and pulled through the sampling tube, uh, or it can be directly applied to the smoke detector head. Uh, that's okay. going to be determined by the AHJ or the municipality what they want. Okay, very good. Um, next question, is there a duct smoke detector, is there something in the code, I should say, that requires a duct smoke detector at every uh, fire smoke damper? And then any exceptions, is there, is there follow-up? Uh, there are exceptions, and again, this is municipality driven. Um, okay. Dampers are required to have detectors, uh, but it also depends on the size of the damper, how much airflow is going through the ductwork, that type of thing. But yes, for, in a general, as a general rule of thumb, if there's a damper there, there should be a, a detector there. Okay, very good. I'll leave the uh, how we can help you question up for one more question, and then I'll go to the final slide here. Uh, so, Jim, they're wondering how many duct sensors can be connected to a single visible enunciator? Um, the industry standard is a one-to-one. -one. Where we differentiate ourselves using the D4120 and in a two-to-one configuration and the, uh, the RTS2, you can actually have two heads connected to one remote test accessory if you do a two-to-one configuration. If you're doing standard duct detectors, then it's one duct detector to one indicating device. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. 
Okay. All right. Very good. Um, there are a couple of questions around the fire alarm control panel. And there, there, the question is um, maybe an obvious one, but does the fire alarm control panel count as a remote indicator device? That's going to depend on the AHJ. Um, some municipalities will, you, will allow that, um, usually in an intelligent uh, panel. Usually an intelligent and addressable, they'll allow that as a remote indicating device because it actually gives them a location. Most cases in a conventional side, that, that doesn't meet the standard. Uh, but again, that's a local municipality decision. Okay, all right. Um, they're asking some, for some code clarification. So um, mm -hmm. they thought you said that the IMC wants detectors in the return, and yet NFPA 90A wants them in the supply. Um, which location should they use? That is correct. Uh, International Mechanical Code requires them to be in the return. NFPA 90A requires them to be in the supply. That's uh, why we kind of reference that if you have a question on the local municipality, you need to find out what's being enforced in your jurisdiction. So Check if you're your working, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because they may be designing to International Mechanical versus NFPA. Okay, very good. Uh, time for a couple more here. Um, can you confirm the magnet test does or doesn't satisfy the NFPA 72 standard for periodic testing? For periodic testing? I, I, I guess I'm not sure what, if, if that's required or if he's referencing the functional test that's required annually, then yes, it does. As us as a manufacturer, it, it does. All right, uh, let's see here, duplicate kind of questions here. Uh, how about this? If a project calls for 100% air area smoke detection, so 100% area smoke detection, does the code require the fire alarm to shut down the air handling unit fan? Let me to repeat uh, that one? No. It, Okay. Again, that depends on if it's being if it's being designed for NFPA 101 or International Fire Code. There's going to be some differences, and in both cases, you're still going to have to shut down the fan, though, because they don't want to transfer smoke. So, All right. yes, the the question is, you know, it should shut down the fan. Okay. So here we go. Last question uh, that we'll get to coverage here. Um, is there a formula to calculate the tube length? So, in other words, what length of tube should they use for specific applications? Well, you saw that we put in that, that chart um, in the previous slide that, that had recommended length. There's not a specific formula. What there is is we want to make sure that we get a representative sample of the air. So you can, can't always fit all the needs for the ductwork on our standard tube length. Some of, the, some of the tubes you have to cut down, other ones you have to protrude to the other side. What we do recommend is that you get a representative sample across the, the width of the duct by having at least 10 to 12 evenly spaced sampling tubes or sampling holes across that ductwork. I know it's kind of a vague thing, but there's not a, a specific answer that Hard and fast, a okay. Right. Yep. All right. Well, very good. Well, we've reached the hour uh, of our webinar. We promise to uh, stay on time here, folks. So, so on behalf of System Sensor, uh, Jim, first of all, thank you for uh, presenting today. Thank you for joining us today uh, as, as well. As a follow-up, uh, you'll see a survey when you end the webinar, or we'll email it to you shortly thereafter, and would appreciate your help in filling that out. And uh, just a reminder that those the NATE and the uh, NTS uh, CU certificates are available by watching this live uh, webinar, and those will be emailed to you before the end of the day. So that does conclude our webinar. Thank you. Please have a nice rest of the day.